Hey there YouTube, Wrestling Optimus here, back with another action figure review. It's Hell in a Cell, considered one of the most brutal match stipulations in WWE, and tonight we're getting a triple shot of it. Not sure we needed that, let alone an entire pay-per-view themed around it, but here we are. As always, if you're new here, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more pro wrestling and action figure content. Now, we're headed into the THUNDERDOME! So for our recap and review, let's take it over to the action figures. On the pre-show, R-Truth interrupts the panel and is confused per usual. He thinks Jeff Jarrett is another famous double J, the road dog Jesse James. Worse still, he thinks this is raw talk again. Charlie explains that it's the kickoff panel for Hell in a Cell, and Truth has a title match against Drew Gulak next. He runs off to prepare. During the match, Gulak starts by trying to befriend Little Jimmy, then kicks him. That sets off Truth, who actually wrestles seriously for once. In fact, that made me realize how similar his gimmick is to Orange Cassidy. Eventually, he goes full John Cena, delivering a five-knuckle shuffle and attempting an attitude adjustment, but Drew reverses. They fight on the top rope, then Truth gets the roll-up victory. Yeah, it was silly, but I love some silly in my wrestling sometimes, as long as it's done right. And Truth always does it right. Never change. Lucha House Party and Akira Tozawa come running out and chase our truth towards the kickoff panel, where Gulak screams, Your childhood hero John Cena sucks! Ali cuts basically the same RETRIBUTION promo they've been cutting for weeks now. He claims to have single-handedly shut down the Hurt business, which I don't recall happening. Then he challenges MVP to pick one man from each side for a one-on-one -on -one match. The main card shockingly opens with Roman Reigns vs. Jey Uso for the Universal Championship. This is the first ever I Quit match inside Hell in a Cell. Jey Uso comes out wearing an ornate white lei, symbolizing culture, family, and opportunity. Michael Cole points out that Jey has actually fought in Hell in a Cell before, but it was in a tag team match with his brother against the New Day. Roman Reigns comes out to a chorus of artificial boos, which is crazy considering how hard WWE tried to hide the boos he used to get for years. There's a clip from the kickoff show where Paul Heyman explains that when Jay quits, the Usos will become Roman's indentured servants. Jay starts out aggressive, using the walls of the cell as a weapon to gain the early advantage before Roman delivers a spear and says, I know one spear won't do it, but in 10 minutes, you're gonna wish you quit now. He hits a second spear and tells Jay to quit so he doesn't have to go any further. But Jay makes a frenzied comeback, hitting two Uso splashes only for Roman to calmly tell the ref, the head of the table never quits. So Jay retrieves a leather strap and starts whipping Reigns. Roman counters with a third spear as Jay cries out that he can't breathe. Reigns takes over the strap and screams, I do the whipping around here. Jay gets it back and strangles Roman until he passes out, but the ref tells him that's not quitting. So Jay goes to use a chair, but eats a Superman punch. Roman locks in the guillotine and screams, I'll take your last breath if you don't quit. Jay passes out, but just like for Reigns, that's not quitting. Roman pulls him into the corner and does a drive-by, but it's not enough. Even Paul Heyman looks concerned now. Undeterred, Roman places a set of steel steps against Jay's face and does another drive-by. The ref can't take any more and tries to call the match, but Roman stops him. He explains that Jay is out, but Roman says, No, you're out, and chucks him over the top rope. Another referee comes in to check on his colleague, while Adam Pearce and other officials try to stop Roman. Rain simply closes the door and throws the steps into the ring. He sets them on Jay's neck as everyone scatters. With his cousin trapped, Roman berates him, saying he understood when they were kids, but they're adults, and Jay is still testing him. He raises the steps overhead when Jimmy comes sliding into the ring and lays across his still unconscious brother. In a heartbreaking moment, using their real names, he says, Come on, Oos, you ain't gotta do this. That's Josh in the middle of the damn ring. This is John right here. Whatever you're going through, we can fix this. We got you. You don't need Paul. This is about family. Roman collapses to the mat and starts to cry, seemingly real tears as his eyes turn red. He openly weeps, I don't even know who I am anymore, I'm sorry. They clasp hands and embrace. Then Reigns sinks in the guillotine. 
Jimmy desperately reaches out for Jay, who wakes up and screams out, I quit. The cell rises up as Paul brings Roman his title belt, and he stands triumphantly over his defeated cousins. Waiting at the top of the ramp are the legendary Wild Samoans, Roman's father Sika and uncle Afa. They hug and ceremoniously place a red chieftain's lei around Roman's neck, a symbol in Samoan culture that they are equals now as tribal leaders. Reigns gestures for his title without even bothering to look at Haman, and holds it aloft. What a brilliant ending and incredible visual. That should have ended the pay-per-view. Jay didn't quit for himself, he quit to save his brother. I also like how everything Roman did was so calm and methodical, especially compared to Jay's frantic style, and the relative silence of the Thunderdome crowd played perfectly into the atmosphere and emotion of the story. A normal crowd would have drowned out the dialogue and ruined it. Seriously, I cannot tell you how much I loved this match. Up next is Jeff Hardy vs. Elias, and it's nearly impossible to get invested after what we just witnessed. Elias tries to get some cheap heat by singing an insulting song at the audience. Jeff comes out, and they have a pretty standard match. Commentary tries to put over the stupid car accident storyline, but in the end, Jeff smashes a guitar over Elias' back and gets DQ'd. Well, that was pointless. Your winner, Elias. It's time to find out who will be Mr. Money in the Bank. Otis comes out to cool new music and dominates the entire match, but seems more focused on inflicting pain than actually winning. When he goes to hit the caterpillar, Morrison pulls Miz out and tries to hit Otis with the briefcase right in front of the ref, causing him to get ejected. Then, out of nowhere, Tucker hits Otis with the briefcase and stares him down. Miz makes a confused cover to become your new Mr. Money in the Bank. It's the outcome I predicted, but I did not see that swerve coming. Like I said in my predictions, WWE booked themselves into a corner and couldn't justify Otis holding that contract anymore. I love him, but it was the right call. Kayla Braxton catches Miz backstage. She congratulates him and asks if the contract was worth ruining Otis's life and friendship with Tucker. He says he did what was necessary and gave the contract meaning again. Miz puts both champions on notice, reminding them that he successfully cashed in before and he'll do it again. Tucker walks over and explains that they were supposed to be a team, but he carried the load while Otis hogged the spotlight. Otis can't even function without Tucker. He gave Otis the confidence to ask out Mandy Rose, and he had his back for years. With that, Otis runs in and attacks. They brawl into the concession area. Our second Hell in a Cell match of the night has been literal years in the making, going all the way back to Sasha and Bailey's groundbreaking match at NXT TakeOver. They've subsequently flipped the heel-face dynamic while adding countless layers of emotion. Bayley is the longest reigning SmackDown Women's Champion in history, while that remains the sole women's title to elude Sasha. Moreover, Bayley's never been in Hell in a Cell, while Sasha has literally been in every women's version, although she's lost them all. They immediately go to the outside and get some kendo sticks. Sasha hits two meteoras, including one against the wall of the cell, then finds two chairs and a table. Even the steel steps get involved as they brutally beat on each other with tons of creative hardcore spots. Banks finds herself helpless in the ring apron as Bailey beats her with a kendo stick. Then, she tries to duct tape some kendo sticks together, but they fall apart as commentary mocks her. Sasha comes out of nowhere with a fire extinguisher and blinds Bailey. She takes over the kendo stick while berating her former best friend. The champ battles back though and retrieves some ladders. She lays Sasha across them and spray paints an X on her torso. Then, she takes a chair also marked with an X and goes to use it, but Banks reverses into another Meteora. To add insult to injury, she gives Bailey her own finisher, the Bailey to Belly, onto the ladder. But Bailey comes back and hits one of her own. She wails on Sasha with a chair until, just like on SmackDown, Sasha manages to counter. She sticks Bailey's head in the chair and applies the bank statement while viciously stomping down on it with her free leg. Bailey eventually taps, and Sasha Banks is your new SmackDown Women's Champion, ending the 380 day reign and finally becoming a Grand Slam Champion. This was yet another incredible match that arguably eclipsed their TakeOver Classic. 
It was the perfect payoff to this half-decade-long story, and just like the babyface Bailey conquered the dastardly boss back in NXT, babyface Sasha finally took down the role model and released her grasp on the women's title. So far, along with the opening Hell in a Cell match, this totally made up for the other two mediocre offerings we were given as filler. Charlie Caruso finds the Hurt Business and asks them about Mustafa Ali's challenge. MVP puts over Bobby Lashley and says he'll be representing them. After deliberating with his associates, they decide on Slapjack for retribution. To raise the stakes a little, MVP proposes no corner men, and Lashley will even put his US title on the line. It's a pretty boring match, Slapjack does manage to get a little bit of offense in, but it ends with the Hurt Lock submission as Lashley retains. Retribution! Swarms the ring, but Bobby rather easily fights them off as the rest of the Hurt Business arrives. Ali falls on the ground and looks up terrified before being saved by Mia Yim, I mean, Reckoning. So even their traps don't work? If this group wasn't completely buried before, they certainly are now. In our main event, Drew McIntyre defends his WWE Championship against Randy Orton, also in Hell in a Cell. At this point, stipulation fatigue is setting in. It doesn't help that this is the longest match of the night, and in my opinion, the most boring Hell in a Cell match. Randy, dressed as a cameraman, jumps Drew during his entrance, but the champ is ready for him. He beats Orton up around the ring before they're finally locked inside, and the match officially begins. The chairs and steps come out, giving McIntyre the early advantage, but when he goes for a claymore, Randy hits his leg with a chair, then presses it into Drew's still injured jaw. He shoves Drew's face into the cell wall and taunts him into the camera. Back on the outside, McIntyre puts Orton through the table that Randy had actually set up earlier for his own use. Randy finds bolt cutters and escapes the cell. He climbs the 20-foot walls, taunting Drew to follow him up. Sure enough, he starts to climb too, and they battle on top of the cell. This does look cool with the overhead scoreboard screens encapsulating them in their own private Thunderdome. Apparently, Randy stashed a lead pipe up there instead of easily accessible under the ring. To be honest, it kind of looks like a lightsaber. Drew disarms him, and they start to descend the side of the cell. Randy slams Drew's head against the wall twice and sends him crashing down through the commentary desk. Orton slowly drags McIntyre back into the cell, then the ring. Drew hits a desperation claymore, but can't make the pin. He sets up for another one and misses, but Randy hits an RKO out of nowhere and becomes your 14-time world champion. Wow, I can't believe they took the belt off Drew with virtually no main event level faces to challenge him. Interesting fact, in October of 2010, The Miz was Mr. Money in the Bank, and cashed in on WWE Champion Randy Orton in Orlando. Now, I'm not saying I want to see that. I think WWE should have continued building Drew and Otis. But, per usual, both young guys lose, and both old guys win. Also, they missed a golden opportunity for Miz to try and cash in on Randy at the end of the show, as he stood on the ramp, beaten up and vulnerable. That was a good pay-per-view, but not great. I absolutely loved the Roman Reigns match, but I really wish they hadn't put it on first because it immediately sapped the energy and emotion out of me, and I think the rest of the audience. That needed to be the closing shot, not the opening one. Don't get me wrong, the main event was pretty epic too, but not only did it not have anywhere near the heat of the Roman match, it was the wrong outcome. That really soured me on the pay-per-view, which, to that point, had been really good. Sure, the Elias vs. Jeff Hardy match was boring and all the retribution stuff was beyond pointless, but the good parts had easily outshadowed that. Then, they had to go and put the title on Randy. I roll. Alright, that'll do it for Hell in a Cell 2020. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know what you thought in the comments down below. I'll be focused on setting up my new AEW set, so there won't be any Raw or SmackDown reviews this week. But, I got some other content going up in the meantime, and I'll be back on Thursday with an action figure review of Dynamite. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to do all that normal YouTube stuff. Smash the like button, share with any wrestling or action figure fans you may know, subscribe to the channel, and spread the word. You can also talk to me over on Twitter, at PSUOptimus, or see all my best figure photography over on Instagram, at WrestlingOptimus. If you haven't seen my review of SmackDown, you can check that out right here. 
But until next time, I've been Wrestling Optimus, and I'll catch you later.